So in this video, we're going to look at the Cancer in the UK case study. This is for the OCR A-level spec, um, which you need to know a case study of one non-communicable uh, disease. Uh, in the case study, we're going to look at uh, the social, economic and cultural causes, the impacts that it has on people and money, and the strategies that are being used by the UK government to try and mitigate this disease. Here's some basic um, facts that are good AO1 knowledge, um, especially the fact that 166,000 people die um, every year. Um, that's with nearly 375,000 uh, new cases every year. So we can see from this graph that since the 90s, uh, the cancer in the UK has uh, risen. Um, it's gone up nearly 1% from 1990 to to now um, and just I put the other countries in to show that there are other countries at different stages of the um, epidemiological model uh, so LIDCs like Mali have very low cancer rates where similar ACs like the United States have um, higher uh, but similar rates of cancer. So in terms of social and economic uh, causes uh, the, the main kind of idea is that it's lifestyle choices so this can uh, be a, a very uh, varied amount of factors, but it can include obesity, uh, poor diet, uh, smoking and alcohol, and the fact that people are generally less active than they used to be. Uh, the, we call this a sedentary lifestyle, so it's a lack of exercise. Because of all these factors, we've seen um, in men a rise of 23% in cancer rates and 43% of women since the 70s. I wanted to kind of deep uh, go deeper into this a little bit and, and we can see this link in cancer very much related to a rise in disposable income. So on the left here, we can see that because when I have more money in my pocket as a country becomes wealthier, I can spend more of that money on things like meat and dairy, and ready meals, so, you know, takeaways, but also kind of foods with high saturated uh, fats in them. And also I've got more money spent on alcohol and, and smoking. Uh, so this obviously leads to specific diseases related to that, bowel cancer and obesity because of all that meat and dairy. But also if I'm smoking more and drinking more, it's going to affect those organs, so the lung and the liver and increase in cancers there. When I've got more money, it doesn't also just affect my diet, but it also affects how I live my life. So I can afford a car, maybe two cars. So I'm not walking and running around as much as maybe people in other countries for example, um, an EDC, so I'm more sedentary. Also, I can afford to go on holiday to warmer countries in Florida, Spain. Again, this affects certain types of cancers. So if I'm in a car more, then I've got a higher chance of cardiovascular disease and obesity. Um, if I'm going on a holiday away somewhere where it's very sunny, I've got more exposure um, to the sun and therefore I'm going to get a higher chance of skin cancer. In the same way that um, we get the highest skin cancer rates um, in Cornwall, where it's often warmest and people go on holiday and therefore we get a, a regional disparity in the UK. This kind of relates into this next factor as a cultural impact that the kind of desire of modern beauty standards is that the people want a tan look. So they go sunbathing and they use sunbeds and that increases their chances of skin cancer. If we were talking in, you know, previous centuries where it was, um, a beauty standard to be pale, this wouldn't have been the case, but that has obviously changed as beauty standards and cultural preferences changed. This, these, these increasing cancers um, obviously have an effect on uh, the economy. It actually costs the economy nearly 15 billion a year. And there are various reasons why. Um, absenteeism, patients are not at work and therefore they are not as productive in the economy. Um, and so they are the economy loses money because of that. The NHS obviously has to pay a lot of money to treat people with cancer. And therefore, uh, again, that's a, an expenditure. People die earlier because they are getting cancers. And that means they are not going to live longer and be more productive in the economy or pay taxes. And the last one, a really significant one, is unpaid care. So par um, parents and relatives often have to take time off work to um, support people who have cancer. And that means, again, they're not in the economy. 
this has a gendered element to it. So it's often women that do a lot of the unpaid care work uh, because of gender stereotypes. And therefore, we can see that women are the real losers in terms of um, this contribution. This actually affects people on a personalised level as well. Uh, if you get cancer, you're more likely to um, have to pay out more or lose more money. And so it, it makes a, a, a person who's got cancer nearly £570 a month worse off. This is in several ways. You might have to hire in help to help you at home because you're, um, you're obviously ill. You, there's added costs of going to appointments. They've even, cancer research said that people have to heat their homes more because they feel the cold more. Um, and also prescription medicines. All of these add an extra financial burden to people who have got cancer. We can now look at this idea of cancer and we can look at spatial variation. So there is obviously areas of the country which are more deprived and unfortunately in these areas these are often where we see the highest cancer rates so much that it's 20,000 more cases in deprived areas than in the less deprived. Not only are there more cases but we actually see that there are um, worse outcomes that means in deprived areas people are more likely to die um, than those living in less deprived areas. One example here is with bowel cancer, where it's um, if you're in least deprived, it's about 60% chance of surviving, but it's a 40% chance, so 20% less chance of surviving if you live in a deprived area. We, we can see that, obviously, in the UK, that that links to kind of our historical past. Um, we said that there's more um, the cancer cases in the private areas, and often these are in industrial areas. So the northeast and the northwest of England and South Wales. In this map here, we can see that there is 646 cases per 100,000, and that is um, in the northeast. In the northwest, it's equally high. We get this south north-south divide where London uh, and the south and the home counties have much, much lower rates because they generally, lots of these areas over the whole area have lower deprivation rates. We can, we can look at specific things in deprivation that obviously um, cause, um, cause higher cancer levels. So more deprived areas, factors such as smoking rates are just higher. Um, it's often seen as a coping mechanism if you're quite poor, but you rely on things like alcohol and, and smoking. Um, you're less likely to get screened earlier than if you live in a deprived area, maybe because of a lack of resources, or maybe because of other factors. You might have uh, less time and resources for physical activity, so you're more likely to be sedentary or obese. Um, and again, adults and children are more likely to be obese in deprived areas, and this can be due to a multitude of factors. Um, more barriers. So you might in the kind of areas and the jobs that people do in deprived areas, unfortunately, not be able to get the time off for appointments. All of these factors can contribute to the fact that people have higher cancer rates and higher death rates um, in deprived areas. So this idea that cancer is in the UK is increasing, but in areas that are deprived, there are much, much more um, problems, worse outcomes and higher rates of cancer. So the government has tried to tackle this um, on a national level and its uh, plan is to save 5,000 lives a year uh, mitigating cancer and to do this by direct and indirect strategies. Direct strategies often involve advanced medical technology. So it could be things like endoscopes which it will help with better detection where I can actually get a camera put it inside of the body and I can see where they've actually got cancerous cells and might be able to actually have more precise treatment so here's an example of radiotherapy being used so I target just that bit of cancer and therefore it's um, actually more effective uh, also the, we have free um, free mass screenings of a bowel cervical and breast cancer and these are generally mean more people are being seen and they're, they're actually able to treat more people uh, because they can actually see who's got cancer and hasn't unfortunately we into in terms of effectiveness it could get even better but that would mean that sort of, um, kind of waiting times would have to go down um, because often there's a delay between when you get diagnosed and treated because the NHS it has a lot of pressure on it. So if more money was pumped into this, you would have uh, even further survival rates. Another example of um, direct strategies would involve cancer research. So you're working uh, on understanding the disease, coming up with new treatments and new drugs. 
Uh, the, again, the weakness of this, this is lots of it's done by charities like uh, the Cancer Research UK, and they um, rely on donations that are voluntary from the public or legacies, which is money left by people in their wills. Uh, that can vary year on year. Um, in, a, in a big crisis like COVID, uh, that obviously takes precedent and therefore charities often get less money and therefore can't do as much work. Indirect is slightly different. It, it often involves educating and uh, um, coming up with campaigns. Here's two examples. Uh, the Change for Life, Life campaign, which was trying to reduce obesity by changing people's uh, lifestyle choices. And then also being able to spot symptoms of cancer. So this campaign by Public Health England, which was being clear, told you what to look out for. So you could actually kind of self-diagnose before you went to a doctor, which more more people would um, be able to actually treat, yeah, them, not treat themselves, but see the symptoms so they could be treated and not just ignore them. I've kind of looked a little bit more into depth into Change for Life. It was um, introduced in 2009 by Public Health England, again, trying to reduce obesity. Uh, the kind of If you go on the website, it shows you lots of recipe ideas and activities and advice on what to do, um, especially in terms of children. Um, it was relatively successful in the fact that 4 million families have signed up since 2009, which uh, shows you that people are participating in this. However, again, we need to be critical of this. Despite the kind of rate of obesity having slowed since 2009, it's still gone up. So it was 23% in 2009, and it's 28% of the entire population over 16. And also very similar in terms of childhood obesity rates. It hasn't really had a huge impact in reducing that, which shows you that it can only do so much. I'm going to look slightly more into a specific cancer, um, skin cancer, which has been on the rise. It's actually um, increased significantly and gone up nearly 3% every year in terms of number of cases and seeing how the government is tackling that specifically. So it's got direct methods again where it's got surgery um, that can actually be done to actually get rid of the cancer and also chemotherapy, which is... Uh, where you're having kind of a drip feed to you and, and a kind of uh, med medicine that gets put into your body that, again, is there to try and directly remove the cancer. Indirect methods, uh, uh, again, are being used. The government has come up with these new laws, um, legislation to kind of surrounding the use of sunbeds. So you can't use a sunbed if you're um, under 18. That means that, again, protects people that are often children uh, and you have to be an adult to be able to use it. In these kind of sunbed um, talon salons, they have to have um, actual uh, official supervision and people have to be trained. And so the government has put standards there that make sure you can't go to a, a tanning salon and just use a sunbed for five hours. Um, obviously, they have restrictions on that by the kind of levels and standards that they've implemented. Again, they've used these campaigns to tell people about the dangers of sunbathing and what to use, how to cover up. And, and also this idea that you can self-assess a little bit before you go to a doctor to, to kind of see your symptoms. The last way that they've actually used indirect methods is the Met Office during the summer. They actually issue uh, U level, UV level warnings um, and talk about what's safe and what's not safe. They often do this on the news, on the weather. This is, again, to kind of educate people and to make sure people are actually trying to protect themselves. So if they know if it's in the very high, that they need to take extra precautions. This is, again, one of those things that can be ignored, like all the kind of indirect methods. They can just, some of them can be ignored by people, but it's at least an attempt to educate the, uh, the population about the risks they, they face.